Hello, everyone. This is Keith Stone with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and this is another Cosmo Society online open house. Our guest today is Dr. Kate Tupper, um, who is an associate professor of classics at the University of Washington. Um, Dr. Tupper is a classical archaeologist with a particular interest in Greek art. And among her other projects, she is currently writing an article on the Metopes of Temple C at Thermon, about which she will talk with us today. Now, before I have you begin, Kate, um, I always like to ask our new guests um, what first provoked their interest in classics and for you, classical archaeology. Would you mind telling us a bit? Yeah, so uh, first, hi, and thanks for having me. Um, I was just telling everybody I'm not really sure the first thing that prompted my interest in classics, but I uh, remember taking a class in high school on ancient history, and I became a little bit obsessed and decided I needed to major in archaeology in college. So I chose my college um, to be a place where I could do that and took the intro courses. And the first upper level class I took in the field was on classical Greece. And I think that, and I, I never really looked back. So um, that that's kind of the <laughs> the broad, boring story of what got me in. Yeah, well, that's great. It's always good to hear a little bit yeah. about the inspiration <laughs> behind it all. So, all right, well, let's hear about some Metopes and maybe what uh, drew you first to Thermon. Yeah, so it was actually these Metopes that drew me to Thermon. And uh, am I right to assume that maybe this is not a, a very familiar temple in sight to a lot of people in the Hangout? Should I? I think it's new to me. Yeah, so it's... Um, I should say, first of all, not even everybody agrees that these are metopes. Some people think they were displayed in another way. I, I've been using the term metopes. I think that they were. Uh, for my interpretation, it just really matters that they were displayed on the temple. But one of the problems is that they're, they're so old in terms of Greek temple decoration uh, that we don't really have a lot of contemporary comparanda. Um, they also are very early for monumental painting or, you know, any any uh, narrative temple decoration in the Greek world. So that that was something that grabbed me. Um, also, really, the thing that that kind of got me hooked on these that uh, you'll see when we when we look at them. Um, I have been interested in the Perseus and Medusa myth for a while, and we get two different types of depictions of Medusa on this. Uh, one is what you would expect. It's the, the big grimacing face. Um, it may not even be, be Medusa. It might be one of her sisters. It might be kind of a generic Gorgon. Uh, but the other one that interested me is the one that we'll see in Perseus's bag. And there, she's not really shown with any of the monstrous features. And most people who talk about that myth, most people who talk about that imagery, uh, usually wanted to put the non monstrous version much later. And this seemed like a weird outlier that nobody really talked about, but it it is clearly very deliberate. So uh, that that's what got me interested in this temple. And I, for a long time, like everybody else, kind of threw up my hands and said, this decoration is weird and random, and I'm, I'm not really sure there's much sense we can make of it. Um, but then I, I got to see the Metopes in person, a handful of years ago when I went to the National Museum in Athens. And I think just be having a chance to, you know, to be there to look at them for a sustain, sustained time in person uh, suddenly made some, some bells ring in my head. And I thought, you know, there might be something more coherent happening here than we've realized. So it's, it's sort of been, it was one of those ideas that I think just hated for a, for a very long time before it started to become anything. Great. Um, yeah, I think we're ready for, thanks for the introduction. For All right. Um, we're ready so, uh, to begin. Let, let me see if I can switch you over to the screen view without oh, yes, letting you go away. I have my part um, to play in that. <laughs> so is that good? Can do, everyone do see that? See this? I see some head shaking, yes. So I think we're good. OK. So uh, am I right that the plan is for me to take you through these slides for about a half hour-ish and then yeah. answer questions? Yeah, pretty okay. much. So what we're dealing with here are um, 
a handful of slides showing different myths, some of which you'll probably be more familiar with, some probably less familiar. Um, I've done my best to compress this into the time that we have, but I'll probably leave some things out that you want to know. So uh, please do, you know, make a note of anything that comes to mind, including places where I might have skipped over information that you you wanted to know because you'll you'll you can tell me at the end what pieces I need to fill in. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to move off from the cover slide and actually take us first. Uh, hold on, I want to readjust my window again here. Um, there seems to have been a problem when I was resizing things. So I want to, all right, hold on a minute. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have to try this again. Okay, I think I have this where I want it. So can everybody see the Apinatron on one side and the cup on the other side? Mm -hmm, I think so. Okay, so um, as you'll probably notice, these are not, 7th century, and they're not metopes either. But I am starting with these two images because uh, there are a couple of big overarching structuring, structuring concepts to my interpretation here. Uh, and they have to do with the way that um, marriage and specifically men's and women's roles in marriage were conceived of in the Greek world. And so I wanted to start by taking you through a couple of those basic concepts and then showing you how I'll, I'll apply those to, to the metopes. And I'll start off by saying that the, the, two, the two vases I have on screen here are, uh, they're from the, the classical period, so late sixth and fifth centuries. But these, these ideas I'm dealing with, these uh, metaphors I'm dealing with, these ways of configuring and talking about men and and maidens, these are all quite old, and you know, I hope you'll see they're they're contemporary with the, the temple I'm talking about too. So um, one idea that you may or may not have run across when thinking or reading about uh, young men and young women and marriage is this idea of uh, maidens, you know, unmarried girls who travel in packs. Um, you'll usually have a, a group of them, whether they're sisters or just peers. We hear that they're all beautiful. There's usually one who's more beautiful than the others, and she becomes the target of sexual attention from a hero or god. And uh, the person who really pulled out all of all of this information, who, who realized there was a coherent pattern in uh, Greek poetry and ritual was Claude Kalam. And I, I think this might be one of these texts you have up available on the CHS website, the mm -hmm. choruses of yes. young maidens. So this, you know, this is one some of you might have run across. You, you uh, could yeah, read I think back. actually that the book club, the Cosmos book club did that book, read that oh, book good. Uh, last month, maybe it was? Recently, a month or two ago, actually. Good. So perfect. So, so some of you might be familiar with this. Um, I don't know if you dealt with the fact that this also has a pretty coherent type of visual representation. And I'm showing you on the screen, uh, on the left here, you have the more expanded formula for showing this kind of thing. And on the right, you have an excerpt. And in both cases, they show you Peleus's abduction of Thetis. And I'm sorry for the way that image on the left kind of curves. I hope it's pretty legible. I'll, I'll describe it. Uh, but what you can see in the center, and are you able to see my cursor moving? Mm -hmm. if I, yes. Okay. I wasn't sure if that would show. So in the center, you have uh, Peleus grabbing onto Thetis. You can see kind of violently. And she's resisting. You can see she's, remember, she's a shapeshifter. She turns into these various animals to try to resist him. And you have this one little sea creature crawling up his leg. Uh, you see her father standing by kind of... Um, very quietly watching the proceedings. This is normal. And then her sister, these age mates, they are scattering in terror. 
And on the right, I'm giving you a, an excerpt of that type of scene in a drinking cup. There you can see Thetis is turning into a few more animals. There's the, the lion on the left. There are a couple of snakes, uh, but this is how she goes through her, her shape shifting. And this is a common type of image that we find for various uh, both named and anonymous young women. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about Persephone's abduction by Hades, but it follows a similar formula. The reason that I've chosen Thetis to show you in the imagery is that one of the cool things about her is that she kind of literalizes the, the metaphor or one of the metaphors underlying this sort of idea um, because she is literally a bunch of animals or she, she becomes a bunch of animals. Uh, but what we find in, um, in the, the poetry and, and ritual and images that, that deal with this idea is that the, the young women involved, uh, they are talked about as metaphorical animals that need to be hmm. hunted and or tamed. Uh, in other words, kind of broken in, in some way by the, by the potential husband. And so marriage is this hunting and, and taming process. And in fact, the reason that I'm, I chose this particular example on the left is that this is part of a larger uh, decorative program on this vessel I'm advancing slides here now. Okay, I don't have time to take you through this in detail, but the other two slides on the screen here show you other the other sides of this particular vessel. And the top one shows you wedding preparations. Uh, the bottom shows you another moment in, in the Greek wedding that would have happened after the procession. So essentially what we have here is a sequence of images showing moments from the Greek wedding, except the procession is replaced by this abduction instead. And it's really kind of putting right up there in our faces this idea that the that marriage that the wedding ritual is about the groom uh, taming the bride so are we good so far on that okay mm -hmm. so. so this is something that you know again we sometimes have these mythical women but sometimes when we just have these generic women um, okay I don't know why my screen view is changing a little bit here but you can I think you can see the parts you need to here uh, we sometimes get these un unnamed women too who are pursued by unnamed heroes we we don't always know who they are that doesn't mean the Greeks didn't know who they were but the important thing is this is a, a generic pattern it's something that that was very very common and so on this vessel that's in black and white uh, there you can see the two different sides of it we have a hunter um, in his cloak and his hat and his spears pursuing the woman uh, she is running she's on the other side of the vase. And then I've given you for comparison, a scene of the same hunter or the same type of hunter. Uh, the, the only difference there is he's wearing his hat on his head instead of having it thrown over his shoulders and he's spearing a, a boar. So you can see by comparison here that the the girl is treated as as quarry uh, to be haunted and and penetrated. This this sexual metaphor here is is not accidental. So again, the the pursuit of the young woman is framed as the the hunting and and domestication of an animal. And these are well accepted ideas. These are not my ideas. These are just background. Uh, they're they're important background to what I'm going to be showing you on on the thermon metapes. Um, the, the examples I've been showing you are a little bit later, 6th and, and 5th centuries. Uh, this one that I have on screen right now, and I'm sorry, I could not find a published color image. Uh, but this is a, a bowl that is co more contemporary with the, the temple that we'll be looking at, or the, the, the images we'll be looking at, the metopes, which come from the, the 7th century. And this dates uh, more closely to that period. And Susan Langdon has, um, in the last, 
I, I think of it as recent. I guess it's almost 10 years old now. She's uh, she's written a book on many of these themes in uh, geometric and seventh century period art. And she's noticed that a lot of these same ideas about uh, men and women and hunting and taming and domestication and so on are are present in uh, in the art of this period too. This was this was very much something that the artists were interested in. It just looks a little bit different. Um, but we frequently get these these men leading horses. Uh, you can see that on these two little panels on the top, and then this central one down in in right in the middle of the screen. Then to the left, you see these girls holding each other's hands. We we know they're girls because or women because of how they're they're dressed. They're in these skirts, and I, I think uh, Langdon pretty plausibly interprets this as this this period's visual version of that maiden chorus kind of image. So here, you know, in the visual art in this period, we're, we're still, uh, we are already dealing with this idea of these girls as these creatures who travel in packs, uh, dance in choruses, they're like animals, that is, is their social role. And the, the potential groomsmen, the potential suitors' uh, social role is the figure, is to be the, the, the man who can hunt and tame and domesticate and lead animals. So this, this uh, may be a, a deliberate juxtaposition here. Uh, so, so far, so good? Mm -hmm. All yes. right, so let's then move on to our site itself. And I don't know why these slides are, I keep losing the full screen view. I think I've got it sized back to where it, it needs to be here. Um, so, Let's yeah, side. okay, there we go. So this, um, we'll jump over to, to Thermon. And I'm not going to give you a whole lot of history uh, into this site because, that that would take forever. But this is one of these interesting sites where there's actually a lot of continuity from the, the Bronze Age. And that is not really a big part of my argument. I'm just mentioning it because uh, some people have tried to interpret that fact into the interpretation of the temple and, and its metopes. And it, it may very well be something that needs to be considered. Um, and in fact, if you see at the very far right, you can see the uh, the temple that is is drawn there in green, but then there are those two long earlier buildings from from earlier centuries. This was this was built on top of some other kind of building here. Uh, now, what we have these stone foundations come from the Hellenistic period, but they are they're sufficiently archaizing in plan that we think it, it followed the, the plan of the older temple. And what they seem to have done here is put these uh, these metopes from the seventh century temple back on the Hellenistic temple when they when they um, renovated it. So that's that's our just our basic background to the site and it and the temple. Uh, this is somebody's conjectural reconstruction of how these things might have been might have been displayed. So you can see up in in the frieze here. Now, jumping to the, the metopes themselves, um, there are a couple of different problems that we have to deal with. One is that you can see they're, they're incomplete. And when I say they're incomplete, I mean that both in terms of the ones that we have and also uh, the ones that do survive are very fragmentary. So this is what, what we're seeing here is just a a section, a small group of what probably there would have been more of them. Uh, we we have some sense of what some of them might have shown, but it's possible there are also a bunch that were that were lost. So, like everybody else who's worked on this, I'm working with what we have. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, can oh, I ask, ahead. is this about maybe half of them, do you think? Uh, or is there a way of, of estimating that? So this is the problem because this is such an early temple that we don't know. Um, we don't know if they all would have been decorated. Uh, you know, some mm. of the, it's, we simply don't know. I I would not be terrifically surprised if it's if it's actually under half. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I can talk a little bit more at the end if you want me to about why I think we could still say something, even though there's there's so few of them. But maybe that's best saved for the the Q and A. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So Great. so what we do have, and I'm I'm generally going here with the identifications that other scholars have have given us here, and I'll I'll talk about the ones that are more and less certain. Um, and I'll talk more about each of these myths as I go through the metopes. But this one on the top left, uh, we know for certain that this shows us Idon and Kelidon because there's an inscription there that's very legible that tells us uh, that one of these figures is Kelidon. I'll talk more about this myth. You might know them better as Procne and Philomela. It's one of these really grotesque mm -hmm. Greek myths that was taken up by the Romans. And uh, these are not figures who usually appear in any kind of temple decoration. And we don't even have a great visual tradition for them. So that's a little weird. Uh, moving down, we have this Perseus metope that I talked about. He's fleeing with Medusa's head. We'll look more at that. We also have this head of a Gorgon here, which is pretty well preserved. Uh, moving up to the right, we have a hunter. We don't know if this is a generic hunter or a specific hunter, but he's certainly returning home from the hunt with, with the stuff that he's killed. Uh, then below him, this metope here, and I will I will give you uh, watercolor drawings here too. I just didn't have place the room to put them on the screen. Uh, you probably can't see what's going on here at all, but it shows two women who seem to be undressing themselves. They're burying their breasts. And the usual interpretation here is that these are the uh, daughters of Pridus who have gone mad thinking that they are uh, animals. This, this has to do with uh, a punishment because they rejected either Dionysus or or, or Hera, um, and they go running through the, the countryside, mooing like cattle. Uh, eventually, they are, they are cured. And part of this cure, uh, part of this story seems to involve uh, the institution of maiden choruses to to Artemis in, in this particular region. And so you might be seeing already why the ideas that I introduced are going to become important to, to my interpretation of this group of metopes. Uh, one thing I should say that I didn't is that we don't know who this temple was dedicated to in this early period. We have evidence mm -hmm. that from maybe the fifth century on, Apollo was worshipped here. So a lot of scholars think, you know, he would have been worshipped in the seventh century when these metopes were made as well. Uh, other scholars say it was Artemis. Um, for me, it I change my mind depending on what I'm reading that day. But uh, the the fact is, uh, you know, it I'd kind of like it to be Artemis, but it would it would work. This interpretation would work well with either god. They're both very concerned with the socialization of young people, and I that's that's a big part of the theme that I'm seeing here. Uh, the seated triad here at the bottom, this metope seems to have been painted in the Hellenistic period. It's clearly in an arch archaizing style. We don't know if it reproduces a, an existing archaic metope. I can talk more about that at the end. If you want me to, that's going to be less important to my discussion of these other mythological ones. Um, it's either showing us a group of goddesses, or maybe goddesses and a god. Some people think maybe it's Leto, Artemis, and and Apollo. So either you know, either it's a group of women, or um, the the divine triad of Leto and her children. Both interpretations would would fit pretty well with what I'm suggesting. Uh, but that that metope I'll be talking about the least. All right. So uh, so far, so good. Have I left anything terribly unclear at this point before I launch into the pictures themselves? I don't think so. Any questions from the group? I don't see any hands or anything. So yeah. Okay. So uh, as I said, um, a lot of most people who have worked on this uh, on these metopes have kind of thrown up their hands. Um, and said, we're never really going to be able to find anything coherent here. Uh, you know, this is an old site. We don't know exactly what was going on before this temple was built. Maybe there was some old Bronze Age cult here and and survivals from that maybe explain this kind of random choice of images and and myths. And that, you know, that there there probably were hangovers from holdovers from that period that 
that would have been important to some people's interpretations here. Um, I am not terrifically confident that we can access those. And, and I think that just looking at these images within the context of what we know about the seventh century, we actually can say something pretty coherent. So to start again with the, the daughters of Pridus or, or these figures that are thought to be the daughters of Pridus, I think you could see a little bit better here now if you look at this watercolor reproduction on the right, uh, you have these two young women. You can see that they they seem to be wearing lavish robes from the waist down, but they're they're bearing their breasts very clearly and it seems deliberately. And in this period, that is unusual for for women. That's not something that, that maidens are supposed to do. And the, the myth, again, that this seems to fit most closely with in the general scholarly opinion is this myth about Pridus's daughters. And we don't, we don't really have a good solid iconographic tradition for them, unfortunately. Uh, we've got this interesting contemporary ivory that's now at the Met that, that may show these, these figures uh, disrobing themselves. You can see the girl on the left here, Her the, the top of her robe is already down and she seems to be untying her belt. So, so that may show us these young women. Um, but I'm I'm accepting the interpretation that that is what we see on the metopes, and it, it, assuming that's the case, we have these these animal maidens par excellence. You know, we we've got the story of what can potentially go wrong with with young women. You know, they they actually start to embody the metaphor. They really think they're animals. They they go wild, and then we see at the end of that these these civilized maiden choruses kind of instituted as a as a correct to this situation as a, as a social way of, of taming this, this wildness. And this is something that uh, Claudia Antonetti, she's, she's one of the people who is, has tried to look at these, these metopes and, and said, um, you know, we might have something a little more coherent here than we thought. She, she said, you know, look at the, the daughters of Pridus here, look at the hunter here. You know, we know that that hunters have a lot to do with uh, the socialization of young men and and young men's uh, young men's growing up, uh, their the, the social roles that they're supposed to to move into. And she said, maybe in these two metopes, we've got some sort of initiatory theme. Um, I don't love the word initiatory in this case because it can it's kind of too vague and too specific at the same time. But I, I think she was on to something with her idea that we're looking at uh, a set of ideas here about, about young men, young women, uh, their roles or their, their ideal social roles in marriage. He is the, the hunter, the tamer, they are the animals. And I think that she was right to see that not just in these two metopes, but I think that to some degree, uh, those ideas were, gen were generally um, an anxiety around marriage and the anxiety around maybe things that can go wrong with this process of hunting and taming and marrying and so on. Uh, I think that this is going to be a key to understanding these, these other metopes too. So moving on to Idon and Kelidon here, um, you can see two seated women. I think you can probably make out, even if you can't read it, we have this retrograde inscription running over the head of, of Kelidon here. I, I kind of shudder to think of what we would make of this metope if we didn't have this inscription um, because it would be very hard to identify. It's it's only through serendipity that this survives. The the other woman, we don't have her inscription. We we know by elimination who she has to be. Um, and you know, early reports say there were a few letters there, so she was probably inscribed. It just doesn't survive. Um, in the crook of Kelidon's arm, you can see maybe just you could sort of make out the head of a child whom I've shown here on this, this drawing. And if you're not familiar with this myth, um, this 
This is, again, better known. Most of us know this as the story of Procne and Philomela, but they seem to be more or less the same, the, the, the same mythological pattern here. And it's one of these really uh, horridly grotesque stories. Uh, the, the kind of full version that we get by the fifth century is that uh, you have Procne Idon, and she is a sister of Philomela Chelidon, and uh, Procne marries a man named Tyrius, and she gets lonely, and she sends for her sister. Uh, Tyrius goes and and fetches her sister, and in the process of bringing her back to see to see Procne Idon, he he rapes Philomela Chelidon, um, and it, it, again in, in the story that we have by the fifth century, he also cuts out her tongue so that she can't say what was done to her. Uh, but she finds a way to get word to her sister. Uh, she she seems to maybe, you know, maybe be hiding out in a cave. It's, it's uh, our evidence is, is kind of fragmentary, uh, but she weaves a cloth and, and sends it to, to him or to, to, to her sister. And so her sister discovers what has been done. Uh, the two women, in order to punish Tyrius, they kill his his child and and Procne's child, uh, Idon's child, uh, it Itus or Itulos. He goes by both names. Uh, they kill him. They bake him into a meal. They they feed him to Tyrius. When Tyrius discovers what he what they have done, he he pursues the women in anger, and everybody then turns into birds. Uh, it's it's one of these really, uh, really, really strange myths. Um, they, they become a swallow and a nightingale and a, and a hoopoe. And so what we see here, uh, again, you know, you would think there would be all sorts of moments you could show of this myth to, to really make it evident that's what, what's going on. We, we don't know whether all of those parts were were here in this earliest version. Uh, but what they seem to be focusing on is some moment involving the two sisters and the, the child. Uh, most people think that they're in the process of butchering him to feed him to his, his father. Some people say maybe they're they're mourning him. Um, I would kind of think that if they were mourning him, maybe his head would be more likely to be in his mother's arm, not his his aunt's arm. I like the butchering interpretation, but it it could be either. Um, and what, you know, this might, this might kind of seem strange to us because this is in many ways, maybe one of the less, you would think, visually distinct moments. It, it's the hard, one of the harder ones to convey what's going on. Um, but it is actually consistent with what we have of this early visual tradition, which seems to stress the women's culpability. And this is important to my argument. Um, I think when we when we're thinking about this myth, it can be easy to think, well, you know, Tyrius is they're all kind of monsters, but he started it. He he raped the sister. He did this terrible thing to her. He he cut out her tongue. Uh, everything the women did was was in revenge. But for the Greeks, uh, this this early visual tradition, you know, starting from the seventh century, from this metope to what we see in, in the sixth and fifth centuries, uh, it, it stresses the horrible things that the women did. So we get the moments of the, the murder um, or you know, just the moments right before the murder where they're about to, uh, about to kill the child. Uh, we also interestingly see them uh, fleeing from Procne or from, from Curious, excuse me, in, in the visual tradition. And uh, this th this is a about 500 BCE. This this image that I have on the screen right now, this amphora sides A and B, and we've got on side A, Tyrius is pursuing Procne or Idon. You can see the transformation has started. She has this little bird on her head, um, and then on on side B, we have Procne, Idon, and Philomela, Chelidon fleeing Tyrius, and uh, so we have you know part of the the pursuit. We have one of the figures repeated, and that's that's not terrifically uncommon. And this is actually a, a set of images that I'm working on for a separate short article, um, because people have usually talked about the pursuit here, the 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 sisterhood here, as sort of incidental. You know, oh, if he's running after them, that's that's what he has to do. But I think that it's actually not incidental that this image is using this well-established scene of of erotic pursuit. 
because it is it is showing us that these women have reverted to their their maiden state. Uh, they this is a, a kind of a girls gone wild type of of scene. It's the this is the horror of what happens if the husband has not properly tamed his bride. Um, one of the things one of the things that seems to have been important, I think, uh, is not just that he tames the girl, but that he separates her from her sisters. These girls in packs, I think, are are dangerous. And this is one of the things that we find with this story of Idon and Kelidon and 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 Tyrius, that one of the things that's gone wrong is that the Sisters have maintained this bond that is is supposed to have been have have been trumped, have been broken by by marriage, and it, the the myth generally goes a long way to show this marriage being undone and dissolved as as explicitly as possible. You know, they don't just kill the child. They they feed him to his father. And people have talked there, I think correctly about this this idea that, you know, they're they're putting the child back into the body of his father. Um, and and even, you know, the idea of the father swallowing the child, taking him into his belly, there's a sense there of of um, the child Itos going back into the the world uh, this this has been suggested. So we have this this story of these this girl, uh, Idon or, or Procne, who was not properly tamed in marriage, and this this is the result. And I think that this is why we have this emphasis specifically on the sisters here in this metope and and what they're doing, uh, because they they seem to be the the real horror story. Uh, so so far, what we've got, we've got the hunter. We've got these these girls who uh, are probably the the daughters of Acritus who become these animals. You know, they've gone mad. They they think they're they're cattle. Uh, they they go around mooing, and they're eventually retamed. So it's a story that sort of has to do with this maidenhood good gone wrong, but then it gets remedied. Uh, here, we just have this, this marriage that's gone horrifically wrong. The girls revert to their wild state. They, they sort of become feral again. They, they return to the pack. Uh, but this is a, a kind of a negative exemplum for, for a, a marriage for, for the Greeks. Uh, so, so far, so good. All right, and I will try to I will try not to spend too much time on on Perseus and Medusa. I know we're we're coming up on time here, and I do want to give you time for questions. Uh, but this this for me is really the the metope that made all of all of the rest of this fall into place for me because I had been working on Perseus and Medusa for a while, and specifically the, the more maidenly aspects of Medusa, which um, again, may sound strange if you're, if you're used to her, if you're used to seeing her as this uh, horrific, monstrous figure with snakes in her hair and maybe a beard and big staring eyes. And she, she turns men to stone when they, they see her. And when, you know, when you would say the maidenly aspect of Medusa, people think, oh yeah, that's something you might get in Ovid. Uh, but it is there from the very beginning. And uh, I, I'm giving you here a little brief passage from the, the Theogony. I had put this in the little, little packet that I put online. And I'm just going to take you through it quickly. And uh, I'll just ask, you know, clear, clear your brain of any stereotypes, any pre-existing ideas you might have of Medusa here. Um, we hear about her parents. Uh, again, Kido Bortophorpus, the fair-cheeked Gryi, uh, sisters gray from birth, and both death and both and both deathless gods and men who walk on earth call them Gryi, well-clad Pemfredo and Saffron robed Ennio. And she bore the Gorgons, who dwell beyond glorious ocean in the frontier land towards night, where, where are the clear-voiced Hesperides, uh, Steno and Euryale and Medusa, who suffered woeful things. She was mortal, but the two were undying and did not grow old. With her, the dark-haired one, this is Poseidon, lay in a soft meadow among spring flowers. And when Perseus cut off her head, great Chrysaur and the horse Pegasus sprang forth. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty brief here. It, it's, a, it's a pretty short description. But one thing you'll notice is that there's, there's really no mention here of anything 
monstrous about the Gorgons. And uh, this is not just a result of what the Theogony likes to do. You know, it, 15 lines later, we're into vivid descriptions of monsters again. So if if this poem wanted to, you know, bring a monster before our eyes, it it would. Uh, instead, we hear of these, these sisters who are kind of hanging around in their garden um, until a god comes by and targets one. Uh, this is, the, the translations are often very, uh, not, not certain locuitous about this, but they, you know, they just say that they, they lay together. This is really this formula for this mythical rape, this kind of thing that we were talking about before, this, this band of girls, one of whom becomes a, uh, a, a target for a god or hero who, who rapes her. And uh, this imagery of the, the soft meadow with the spring flowers, this is also, uh, this is a very common setting for this sort of thing. Um, and we, you know, if we had time, I could talk more about uh, connections between girls and flowers. The idea that the meadow was sort of like this, you know, it was thought of as, a, as the female genitalia and it, that's being invaded by this, this male figure. I, I don't have time to go into all of that, but I will show you that this, this soft meadow here, you, you have um, in the Greek and Malako Laimoni, this is exactly the same language you get for the, uh, the, the meadow that Persephone is in when, uh, when she is abducted by by Hades. And I've given you here just an excerpt from Greg Nagy's translation of the, the relevant passages in the Homeric hymn to Demeter. Uh, she, Persephone, was having a good time along with the daughters of Okanos who wear their girdles slung low. She was picking flowers, roses, crocus, and beautiful violets up and down the soft meadow, Lymon Malacon. This is the same imagery we get in the, the Theogony uh, for Medusa's meadow. Um, iris blossoms too, she picked, and hyacinth, and the narcissus which was grown as a lore for the flower-faced girl by Gaia. Uh, she, Persephone, was filled with a sense of wonder, and she reached out with both hands to take hold of the pretty plaything. The earth full of roads leading every which way opened up under her. It happened on the plain of, of Nysa. There it was that the Lord who receives many guests, that's Hades, made his lunge. He was riding on a chariot drawn by immortal horses, the son of Kronos, the one known by many names. He seized her against her will, put her on his golden chariot, and drove away as, as she wept. Uh, so Medusa here, really from the beginning of this tradition, is, is placed in this pattern, this tradition of these girls like Thetis, like Persephone, who are uh, hanging out with their sisters, uh, violently imposed upon by a god or hero. In Medusa's case, it's, it's both. And then something sexual becomes of that. Um, Medu in Medusa's case, she she gives birth to Poseidon's children, uh, not through, through the normal way, but through her neck when when Perseus cuts off her head. And there's there's a whole long thing I could say about that that I don't have time for. Uh, but this is is clearly a or cl you know clearly to me, I've argued in a couple of articles. Uh, this is kind of a a monstrous perversion of that basic band of maidens pattern. It, it's it, you're sort of putting it through the this horrifying looking glass in in a way. Um, and I, I'll just show you a couple more images here. This one up here is uh, from the very late fifth century. This shows Perseus running away from one of the Gorgon sisters, and he's carrying Medusa's head. And I don't have time to go into all of the inversions here, but you can see this is clearly making use of this pursuit and abduction imagery. It just has turned around who's the pursuer and, and who's the pursued, but it wants us to, to call that to mind. It, it's kind of telling us you should be situating this, 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 your understanding of this picture in that kind of pattern. We're talking about a band of maidens here. It's just that our, our main girl, Medusa is is really weird. She's kind of a monster. And uh, here is another really early weird Medusa. Um, I'm showing you this because you can see that she's her animal her animal aspects are are really strong here. She's she's part horse. Uh, and remember these these girls are are part animal, whether whether horse or lion or uh, you know some some other animal. Here, like Thetis, Medusa is kind of literalizing this this metaphor, and and Perseus is coming after her, and I. I you know, I really would 
would love to think that this flower at the right is a is a reference to the kind of flowery meadow that we find in in these myths. Uh, there's you know there's no way of proving that, but it's it's pretty consistent. Um, and so again, you know, coming back to the the thermon metope on the left here, it's maybe a little bit grainy, but I, I hope you can see the. Um, the head of Medusa, partly obscured by Perseus's bag, and then contrast that with the, the Gorgon on the right. This is another metope from this temple. Uh, this artist, whoever whoever he was, could have easily given us a monstrous Gorgon in the bag, but, but he didn't. He seems to have kind of gone out of his way not to. And I'd ask you to look particularly at the eyes. They're almost they're almost a little bit uh, droopy. They're, they're, they're covered by, by a lid. Um, so she's looking right at us, but it's not these really wide staring eyes. And for a creature who kills with her gaze, that's that's pretty important. That's that's pretty deliberate. And I don't know if um, of ideas about the the male and female gaze and and the necessity for for eidos and a beautiful woman's gaze have, have come up in any of your readings or discussions. Um, but I, what I'll what I'll say about the one on the left is that we we really see Medusa being shown here with the the kind of of um, the kind of less confrontational gaze that you you might expect of a, a more a more normal woman. So uh, from you know from very early on, even though the gorgons are shown as as monsters here, we we also get on on this particular temple. She seems to be uh, situated within this this kind of maiden myth. So if I want to bring these four together, then. Um, what I think that that one of the things I should say, you know, I, I think we'll never be in a position to say everything that's going on with this temple or with these images. But if we're looking for some kind of unifying principle, if we're looking for some kind of coherent theme, um, I think we have a, a series of meditations or or you know exempla whether positive or negative um that deal in in some way with these ideas of uh how men, young men and women should act in marriage as they're approaching marriage uh what are some different ways of of handling uh the the animalness of girls and and the hunterliness of men. What are the things that can go right? What are the things that can go wrong? I would love it if we actually knew more about who this, this anonymous young hunter is, because it's easy for me to look at him and say, maybe he's kind of the positive exemplum here. He's the one who tells us how this should go. He's a successful hunter. Um, if, he's a, if he's an actual specific mythological hunter, he might be some sort of negative example that I'm not recognizing. But we've got the hunter. We've got, with Idon and Kelidon, we've got the girls who, who uh, the, the marriage didn't take, the separation didn't take, they returned to the pack, they they went feral and, and horrible things happen. You know, if we want kind of a simplistic message out of there, it, it, it would be that you've, you've got to really tame this girl when you're marrying her, you've got to separate her from her sisters. Uh, but I don't want to, I don't want to be that reductive about it. Uh, then with the Daughters of Pritus, we have again, these, these girls who in this case, go wild before their their marriage, uh, before they while they're still young, while they're still maidens, and there the the maiden chorus is is something that becomes uh, that, that that becomes part of the remedy. Then with Perseus and Medusa, we have again here uh, a set of maidens, uh, but like all of these other girls we're dealing with, there's something wrong or violent or monstrous about them just in a different way. And uh, Perseus does triumph over them. Uh, so it's got kind of these, these overtones relating to sexual taming and marriage and so on. But like everything else we see here, it's, it's, fractured uh, through this th this mythological lens. Now, um, one question you might be asking is, do we have, you know, do we, do we have parallels for this? Why should we think that this is the sort of thing that, that would be going on 
on this temple or on these early temples in general. And as I said at the beginning, one of the really difficult things with dealing with this temple is that we don't have too much in terms of contemporary comparanda. Um, but Clemente Marconi has been doing some interesting work on archaic temple decoration, especially in Southern Italy, uh, archaic and early classical decoration. And I just wanna leave you here with a, a couple of things that he says about the, the Metopes at the Temple of Hera at Foce del Sele um, in Southern Italy. He says, this temple offers a further example of the relationship between imagery displayed on a temple and spheres of influence and functions of the divinity. It's not by chance that it's the sanctuary of the goddess of marriage where women were ritually prepared by the city to become wives. Most of the depicted myths were about women, brides to be, wives and widows, some behaving better than others. The metopes functioned as visual equivalents of the hymns performed in the sanctuary in honor of the goddess and fulfilled the same educational role of such hymns by reasserting the, the cultural and social values of the community. And this, I think, may be a good way of understanding what's going on at Thermon. Uh, we have this temple that is dedicated in a later period by the fifth century to Apollo, uh, possibly to Artemis before that. Both of these gods are, are concerned with the socialization of young people, with their transition into adulthood, uh, with, with taming wild things and, and hunting wild things. And I, we, we don't know all of the kinds of, um, of rituals or rites that would have happened in the sanctuary, but I, I think that it, it is very well within within reason and within the character of these sanctuaries to think that um, to think that our, our metopes, that our temple decorations might be related to these aspects of the gods. So I think that maybe one thing we're seeing with these metopes is that just like in a hymn to a god or goddess, you might you might get a, a, a myth or a series of myths strung together that that comment sort of obliquely on an important theme to to uh, that god or to to that ritual or to whatever you're celebrating. Uh, I I think that that's that is probably what we're looking at Thermon too. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I know it's coming up on nine o'clock. I have more time if if you do. I'm sorry if I spoke a little long, but I'm I'm going to turn it over to you, Keith. Okay, great. Thanks. That was really fascinating. Um, all those details coming together. Um, yeah, we we started a bit late, so we can go a bit late. I think. Okay. Um, let's see. We've lost your picture. Yes. Um, maybe uh, you'll appear in a moment. See. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Q and A. There is one question that came in from um, a YouTube viewer that was typed into the chat, which mm -hmm. I will ask here. Um, you mentioned um, the failure of husbands to properly tame their wives. Mm -hmm. um, this person says, in in many myths, there is the motif of a hunter being killed by a beast. Um, do you think this can be interpreted in the uh, context of marriage well, uh, of a husband um, failing to tame his wife? Um, yeah. There are no examples given here in this question, but um, what do you think about that? Well, the one that comes to my mind immediately is Adonis. Um, and yeah, Laurie Wrightsummer actually in a recent book on the Adonis Festival has, has talked about imagery of Aphrodite and Adonis, where in some ways Adonis, if I'm remembering her article correctly or her argument correctly, I think Adonis is in some ways, I, I forget if she goes far as far to say that he is presented as the bride, but hmm. you know, because Aphrodite is the god in this relationship, she's the more powerful one. Um, some of these images and metaphors of relating uh, men and women become become disrupted, and some of the the ideas kind of become um, redistributed. And you know, there it's it's Adonis who is is speared by a boar in the thigh. It's a it's a very sexualized kind of penetration that you would expect of of the woman. And uh, I think I, I think Wrightsheimer does a really nice job of of showing some of these kind of feminine feminized bridal aspects of of Adonis. And you know, this I mean, think in in the Homeric hymn to, to Aphrodite when Aphrodite presents herself to to Anchises, he's he's terrified. You know, there there's there's this sense that he's maybe about to be unmanned in some way. That there's something 
horrifying that can go wrong um, when when you're a, a man who's in confrontation with a, a goddess like this. The the normal rules of masculinity and femininity and so on they don't necessarily they don't necessarily apply. So yeah, I think that um, I I don't know what what other myths the the commenter had in mind, but I I would say absolutely from you know from the ones that that jumped to my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can think that um, even if it's not about the reversal of roles, um, perhaps just an animal being um, hunted would have that, that kind of fear. And I think in the Baki, there's a scene where the, the fawn is being described um, being chased by the hunters and um, yeah. trem trembling and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And what I just want to um, say that what you were saying really uh, made me see in a new light the play Hippolytus, um, mm -hmm. where uh, Phaedra wants to become a hunter, and Hippolytus himself is the prey, so to speak. And he's, um, you know, he wants to stay in the garden. He wants to hang out in this chaste virginal garden with the fresh water. And yeah, this actually, um, when I when I teach this class, it's it's. When I when I talk about the Hippolytus in class, the the way I talk about it is very influenced by the way Greg always talked about it in the Heroes course when I was a TF for that. Um, and these yeah these ideas are all are they're all very much there. But but as with as with Aphrodite and Adonis, you've got you've got some of the normal images, some of the normal normal normative metaphors uh, kind of redistributed among the players and. I, I would think that's probably an idea that might be familiar with a lot of your group. I you know I know I remember I don't know if this has come up in in your reading a lot, but one thing uh, Greg Naj always said to his class when he was teaching heroes is that what what goes wrong in myth goes right in ritual. You know, so a lot of these you you the the things that are supposed to happen correctly in marriage uh, when you have them talked about mythologically, uh, it, when you get these mythological relationships between men and women, it's often precisely those things that go wrong. Uh, and then and then ritual becomes the the corrective. So I think it it maybe shouldn't be surprising that we we have you know the, the, the myths around this tend to be weird and unsettling and, and upsetting and, and don't don't quite do it as a normal human marriage should. Mm -hmm. There's a question from Ian here. Um, in the real 7th to 5th centuries, um, were there any social practices that tamed women beyond um, patrilocal marriage? Well, the the choruses that they would dance in, in, um, in, in sanctuaries and in, in rituals, I think that the the act and the fact of, da of dancing and, and uh, being being put together with with these girls and and uh, having to sing and dance in unison and, and so on. I, I think that there was definitely an element there of um, of of maybe a, a partial kind of domestication. Um, marriage is really the the big one. Uh, then you know we get all sorts of we get all sorts of rituals that make reference to to animals in some sort, you know, in some way, I'm thinking of the, the whole playing, playing the bear for Artemis and, and people have, have argued at length to no end about what precisely that, that means. Um, but you do, we do see this, this animal imagery being evoked in, in a ritual context, um, whether or not it's always being used for this, this taming purpose is maybe a, maybe a more complicated question. Other questions? Maria. Um, oh. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Kate. Um, I'm really interested uh, in what you just uh, mentioned about uh, Thermon and mm -hmm. uh, how you presented all these uh, metopas. Let's let's call them metopas for mm -hmm. the economy of uh, our discussion. Exactly. Um, <laughs> um, one interesting question that I would like to. Uh, um, to discuss with you is do you believe that the mythological background as presented uh, by Melagros' uh, story in um, Iliad 9 and what Craig Nash wrote about Meleagr and um, uh, this mythological example, do you think that all this mythological background points toward uh, a certain Certain, let's say, uh, attribution of uh, the temple uh, to Artemis, or are you inclined? Because you mentioned that you haven't really decided whether uh, <laughs> the patron god is uh, Artemis 
and um, or uh, Apollo. I mean, could you like to share more about you, uh, your your um, um, your thinking on this topic? So yeah, so one of the reasons that I, I, well, there are a couple of reasons I, I hesitate here. One is that uh, we, we don't know what would have been normal for a temple of this period and its decoration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I can look at 6th century temple decoration or 5th century decoration and say, okay, this is how it, it should work. This is how the decoration should mm -hmm. relate to the divinity. With the 7th century, we don't have that pattern. So that's one reason I'm being hesitant. Um, the other reason I'm being hesitant is that when we when we do know what's going on, um, it there's not always a completely straightforward direct connection between every piece of imagery we find on a temple and the god or goddess mm -hmm. worshipped there. You know, I think it's it's maybe easy for all of us to to think of obvious examples like the Parthenon where we've got a lot of Athena imagery and, and mm -hmm. so on. But if I think generally um, of, of temples that we have from the ancient world and from the ancient Greek world, and, uh, and if I ask myself whether we could always uh, back engineer the the identity of the god or goddess from mm -hmm. from the decoration if we if we didn't know it i'm not always sure that we could um mm -hmm. and so i am more comfortable saying this is a god or goddess who was worshipped here or may have worshipped here and this is how this imagery probably relates to them mm -hmm. i am just not confident enough in our ability to mm -hmm. identify a god or goddess from the Mm -hmm. from the imagery. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that gets at the substance of your question you, you had asked about. Yes, I, 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 will, I will give you some example. For mm -hmm. example, we know that this, apart from the uh, hunting of the uh, Caledonian boar, mm -hmm. uh, we get some evidence about, for example, um, a war be between the Aetolians and the Curetes. The mm -hmm. Curetes used to be inhabitants of the area just before um i wouldn't say arrival but let's say the the, the definitive settle down of uh, of the aetolians mm -hmm. so the temple the existence of the temple and as you rightly and correctly and very nicely pointed out and uh, uh, expounded to us is that there is uh, this temple existed since the 8th century bce either it alludes in a way that the, the the temple there has also some uh, genealogical significance from the people who lived there, mm -hmm. some overlap. She don't, this doesn't mean that I don't mean continu con continuation. Mm -hmm. You know, some people fought there; uh, they mingled with one another, so they decided to to build a to, to build a temple. This one uh, way of thought. Uh, so th things in Etolia, although they look fascinating, uh, due to lack of evidence, we are not sure how to deal with all this evidence that comes mainly, as you rightly said, from literary sources than from archaeological sources. Unfortunately, we lack archaeological evidence enough, mm -hmm. and uh, there is an abundance of literary evidence. So the essence of my story is whether, in a way, could interlace um or uh, literary and to fill some gaps not all the gaps of archaeological evidence yeah I about the existence of the of the temple i think that i think that might be an aspect that i will need to look into more i think one of the things that you're getting at here that i have not talked about it as much as the the um, no, no, the no. local, spe the local yes. specificity. Yes, 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 yes. I understand. Yes, why you didn't uh, talk about it? I'm just uh, because you're an expert on this particular temple, which is a fascinating temple because it presents us with this continuation of mm -hmm. existence existence there whether you have come up with some sort of evidence whatever the, this may be i haven't yet but it, this this is what i'm saying i think that what you're talking about is maybe a level of specificity that i haven't gotten to yet uh -huh. I've, okay I've been, this is good yes yeah i've been yes. very concerned. this is the answer to my question okay yes <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, thank you
Thank you very much. I think I saw somebody had to leave and typed in, it would look like a long question that disappeared from my screen before I was able to read it. Did that come up on yours? It was a woman in a gray sweater. Uh... Oops, my, my microphone was off there. Um, <laughs> I have it. Um, let's see, the paintings are fragmentary. We can only speculate. So um, although the presentation has been inspired, greatly inspiring, I wonder about, I'm wondering about the following, Kelidon and Idon can also be referred to not as a reminder of what goes wrong in marriage, but also of the bond among sisters who at the end break the lineage. Um, Antigone, who claims the bonds with the brother is stronger than the one with the future husbands. At the same time, Sappho in Fragment 16 makes Helen choose Paris. So women's role is not so evidently displayed. Um, the temple, um, is later used for political purposes as well. And perhaps the bond of Oikos as a proto form of the community at large should be considered as well. Thank you again so much. That's really interesting. And I, I had not thought about this in exactly the, these terms. Um, I think that, I guess I would say, I would say two things there. I think that as you probably all are, are comfortable with the idea that a lot of these myths can, uh, they can be doing more than one thing at a time. And so I, I think that what I have argued um, does not necessarily rule out that something like what the commenter just suggested could be happening, especially in in some periods. I mean, if these metopes are put up in the seventh century and they're put up for a certain reason, that doesn't mean they're going to be thought about in exactly the same way in the fifth century or the fourth century or so on. And um, I, I think that it it's it's quite possible that some of the other interpretation, these other interpretations could seep in. Uh, the reason that I'm stressing the, the bond of the sisters in particular is that is that, that is what, um, what I had to do in, in looking at this was to say, okay, how, you know, from what we know, and it's not a lot, but uh, from what we know, how was this, this story of, of Idon and Kelidon how is this talked about and and thought about in in these early centuries? Uh, what does the visual tradition show us? What what do we know about it? And there, the the bond between the sisters in particular seems to be something that is is a point of anxiety. Uh, the kind of trouble that they can get into when they're together, when when uh, their their bond is not sufficiently well disrupted. So that is why it's it's primary for me in my interpretation of of this temple. But I think absolutely. This uh, this tension that the commoner is pointing to, or this potential tension between Oikos and and the the polis, the city at at large, um, this is something that that could plausibly have been maybe read into this or or seen in in this in this kind of setting. So I. I, that's that's also maybe something that I should make a note and and look at more. It occurs to me that the um, the girls, as you described, are kind of forced into this um, group situation of, mm -hmm. of the chorus, perhaps as a um, means of domestication in one sense, preparation for marriage. But then the bond has to be broken mm -hmm. afterwards, and they can't remain in this what could be a powerful configuration. Yeah, and I think, and that's exactly what I'm trying to argue with the those vase paintings of Procne and Philomela that I showed very quickly. I have like a little spin-off article that that I where that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, people people have focused on the things that are grotesque about that that myth and the images of these girls, and and I think for for reasons that are are right. But what I'm trying to say is that this this reconstitution of the the group the fact that they are shown once again as this this band of maidens that in a way would be as as horrifying as as the child murder because it's it's a way of saying these girls have you know they've gone feral this this didn't take um and, and i think that those images are you know if, if we could say that an image might make an argument i think i think that's the argument that they're making so yeah exactly exactly i'm just restating what you're saying <laughs> okay great um maybe one last question from jack who had to oh well he, he didn't have to leave he was watching on youtube um oh, okay. does medusa get revenge 
Uh, well, it depends on <laughs> it depends on whose perspective you look at it from. Her her gaze remains it remains active. Uh, it remains potent, but. I would say she personally probably does not get anything out of it. You know, she's she's dead. She's she's kind of a a weapon that that remains dangerous even once you know she's she's no longer in the the picture. And so I, I would say uh, we could say revenge is taken, but not really by by Medusa's agency. I mean, all she ever wanted to do was hang out in a garden in her sister's, you know, far with her sisters, far, far away from civilization. Um, and, and, and she, you know, has all these things done to her. And, and no, I mean, she's, uh, her, her head, her gaze, that becomes the important thing once she's killed. But uh, I, I don't know if we could speak of, of a revenge taken by her or her sisters at all. Thanks so much. Well, that's about time for us to wrap up. So I will just thank you again for that fascinating right. conversation that we well, had. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all the great questions. Yeah. All right. So. All right. Bye. Until next time. Bye-bye.